guys, welcome to another video of My Vida Loca. Today, I finally do it. I am doing Murder Tours Part 2 and possibly 3 because it's going to be a long one. I am going to go to Brentwood and Beverly Hills, so stay tuned if you're interested. And if you haven't watched the first one yet, go ahead and check that out. Um, I go to different places uh, near downtown LA and Glendale and Los Feliz. So I'll go ahead and put that in the bio and stay tuned. We are going now to Beverly Hills. Can you guys guess what's coming? Probably not. <laughs> I'm gonna go see the house where the Menendez brothers killed their parents. Execution style. People actually thought that like the mob ordered the hit because that's how they killed them. They killed them like a mob hit. But um I'm going there now. It's this big house, nice house, mansion, and I'll show you guys what we get. Just come and drive with me. By the way, my car wasn't dirty. There's just fires here in California, so it was super ashy. Okay, so it's saying it's gonna be on the right destination. This is it. And again, as always, I feel so awkward. Guys, wow, I did not expect that. Uh, that, like, literally, that it is so weird. That just gives me chills, though. Like, these guys are still locked up for their parents' murder, and it's just crazy. And so, I don't know, it feels weird. Like all the houses that I visited, I don't, I haven't felt that like someone died here vibe, and like right now I did. All right, so for the location, we go to Beverly Hills, and one of the most famous murders that happened in Beverly Hills in California. This is such a famous case, at least in the true crime world, and if you're talking about Los Angeles cases, because it really rocked the city of Los Angeles. Um, when it happened and I am talking about the Menendez murders. Uh, these were two brothers, Eric and Lau Menendez, who killed their parents on August 20th, 1989. And so what went down that night was basically Jose and Kitty, as she was called, uh, Menendez were watching television in the den um, Mary, aka Kitty, was asleep and Eric and Lyle come in and they shoot Jose, their dad, in the back of the head and then Kitty running away, they shoot her in the leg and they shoot her in the arm, they shoot her in the head to the point where she is unrecognizable. They also shot both of them in the kneecaps to make it look like a mob hit and that was actually investigated, but there was no conclusive evidence to insinuate that someone from the mob had killed Jose and Mary. And so the brothers were actually not thought of as suspects for almost seven months. Um, well, not seven months. It took seven months for them to get arrested and charged with the murder of their parents but they got away with it for a pretty long time. And what brought suspicion was the fact that they were out here spending money like crazy. They were buying Porsches, they were buying Rolex, they were traveling, they were, Eric was like playing tennis in Israel. It was just, clearly something was up. These were not kids that were grieving the death of their parents. They bought matching condos in Marina del Rey and it was just, Things were accumulating where police were like, something is up, you know, like these people had something to do with the murder. If they didn't kill them themselves, they hired or something. So what ends up happening is that Eric is seeing a psychologist and he confesses to the murders. And for those of you that don't know, psychologists are mandated reporters, but we can't really report something that happened in the past. Um, we basically report, and I say we because um, 
whether I end up becoming a clinical psychologist or not, or whether I go into counseling or something, I'm going to be a mandated reporter. Um, but basically what mandated reporting covers, you commit harm to yourself, commit harm to someone else, or when you discuss like a plan. So it's like, it's against children, against yourself, against the elderly. And if you talk about wanting to like kill someone, you have to have a plan and there has to be an identifiable victim. And that's known as terrorist off warning. And it varies by state. Honestly, the reporting is different by state, but I'm talking based off of California. Um, but there's definitely some trickiness there between confidentiality. If you make the wrong call and you report something, that could cost you your license. Um, but there's hotlines that you can call and say like, hey, I have this kind of situation and you get uh, advice on whether you should report it or not. Um, I've actually dealt with this in the past with one of my clients. It wasn't related to murder, but it was related to safety of children. Um, but I was thankfully working for a really good team that kind of helped me, that helped talk me through and helped clarify. Um, so at this point, there was this confidentiality, right? The psychologist can't really say anything because the murders were committed in the past. So he has nothing to report because there's nothing really that um, would cause him to break confidentiality because no one's in harm's way. The harm already happened. So what happened is Eric tells Lyle that he told his psychologist. So then Lyle threatens the psychologist and he did break confidentiality in the sense that he told his mistress that Eric committed these murders because he felt threatened. The psychologist could report something because now he's being threatened and his life is at risk, right? So he has a right to break confidentiality. Even though it wasn't Eric, it was Lyle threatening him. And in threatening him, he basically says, look, this is why. Um, it's honestly really tricky. The reason that this trial took so many years this didn't go to trial until 1992 they got apprehended in i believe 1990 so it took a couple years for them to go to trial because of this you know looking into did this break confidentiality was he able to say anything and report it but essentially yes he was because lao threatened him once that happened police had their in and they arrested them and Initially, they were tried separately and, you know, their defense attorney was talking about, oh, like the parents were abusive, mainly the father, you know, he was inflicting years of physical and sexual abuse, he was a pedophile. They painted Kitty to be a drug addict who was complicit with the father abusing the kids. And so they went through this whole, oh, it wasn't murder, it was self-defense. Um, and that's... That's honestly really tricky too. And there's a lot of psychology behind that and it's really interesting and I'm not gonna go into it in this, but if you guys are interested in videos like that, breaking down the psychology of, I can't say the psychology of murder and it definitely varies case by case, person by person, because we're not all clones, but there's a lot of patterns that you can see. Um, but you know, there's obvious evidence um, that shows how victims are at risk for them to have mood disorders or just disorders in general this is along with externalizing disorders which i'll cover in future content and they're at risk for developing substance abuse disorders and becoming abusers themselves but um yeah that i could do that like in another video at some point in time if you guys are interested in that um so back to this yeah they get tried separately and a jury hears all this talk about abuse and the boys were pretty young when this happened i believe they were i have my ipad here because it's i'm like talking to you guys about so many cases it's hard okay so <laughs> yes i have cheat sheets they were like in their 20s eric is younger than lyle but um yeah I think like 2019 or something. One of them was a teen. Eric was younger and Eric was not in his 20s yet, but Lyle was. It ends up being a hung jury. And so they have to 
say it's a mistrial. And for those of you that don't know, a hung jury is basically when, when you're dealing with murder cases, you need a unanimous vote of guilty. So it can't be like, oh, 11 say guilty, one says no, that's a hung jury. So it leads to a mistrial and you have to do everything all over again. Um, so basically they both had hung juries and they were both in this trial. So they charged them right away though, because they were not going to let them go. And the next time that they try them, they put them together. So they try them together instead of separate. So when they try them together, they are found guilty of two counts of first degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder and they're sentenced to life in prison. And so the jury decides to not give them the death penalty and that basically stems from the fact that they had no prior convictions and no violent behavior before the murder of their parents. And they were both sentenced to prison and they were actually not placed in the same prison until about 22 years later. Um, they ended up getting placed in the same prison but in different units and then eventually same units and now they're part of this um, program that focuses on rehabilitation they will never see freedom again um, but a lot of these programs kind of just focus on having people come to terms with what they did and also kind of just help them like live non-violently and just as best of a life as you can live in prison after doing what you did. And I am here for it. I believe in stuff like that. I understand that these people, like I've said in the first one, this these videos are not to romanticize murder or people committing crimes or serial killers. But it's just so pivotal to understand why people do this stuff. It's not black and white ever. It's not, this person was born this way, this person was raised to be this way. Like, we need to start viewing people holistically and realizing that everything plays a part. And I kind of got a greater sense of this once I was doing my research in psychopathy. And I say that like I've done this like major thing. I haven't done my own research. I did a meta-analysis. And what a meta-analysis is, is basically a review of the literature and so I had to do that for class and, you know, I did a poster of it in New Orleans, which was the trip that you saw um, in my travel vlogs. And if you haven't seen it, go ahead and check it out. And um, I'm set to do a talk for this conference, WPA, in October. But that really, one of my biggest research questions were, you know, does the environment play a part in psychopathy because psychopaths are born? It's, it's something that is altered in brain chemistry and you know my research showed that it did it was a moderate effect it wasn't huge but had i had a bigger sample size as in more articles not just 10 i'm pretty sure that we would have seen this general trend that you see across psychology and, and across um facets facets like this so um i'm kind of going a little off topic but that's the stuff that i'm interested in this is what i want to kind of dedicate my life to um but I don't remember what, what was I talking about? Oh, the rehabilitation stuff. So yeah, I believe in it and I'm here for it. Yeah, you're never gonna see, you know, the light of day as people say, as in step out in the streets and, you know, a jury of your peers found justifiable cause for you to never see freedom again. But that doesn't mean that you're a throwaway and it doesn't mean that you can't learn from what you did and that people can't learn from you and that we can't. It's just, this is a very difficult topic to get into because it's like, how can you be compassionate or empathetic to someone who had no compassion or empathy for the person that they killed, the life that they took? And I completely understand it. I don't justify what murderers do or what serial killers do or what anybody does to take a person's life. But I definitely think that there's things to learn, as I said, and I think individuals too, if you can just think of things you did 
when you were younger, when you were in certain mind states, when you were in a certain point in your life. And again, no justifications. Like we can go through a million different things and it didn't lead to murder. I am completely aware of that. But if you can just think back to one thing that you regret or that you think back on and you're like, oh my gosh, why did I do that? It kind of gets a little bit easier to see how someone can be in this volatile state of mind that leads them to do things like commit murder. And again, no excuse, but I think it's important. And I think that we shouldn't just lock these people up and not take anything from what they did and helping us evolve as a society and helping the field move forward so that we can develop interventions um, and preventative treatments or preventative programs. And that's essentially what intervention is. Um, but yeah, so they're both in that and that basically sums up. I know I went on this whole tangent. This video is gonna be long. Yeah, um, that's basically the story of the Menendez brothers and how they killed their parents and then went on to live their lives like nothing was wrong they were just happy that they got daddy's money and it's sad it's crazy to think how you can kill your parent how you can kill anybody but your parent that you have this connection with that you were raised by who is your blood there's differences there um, and that's also stuff that I'd want to research in the future. Like, where are those differences? Does it matter? So yeah, that's that location in that beautiful mansion in Beverly Hills. Okay, so that was the Menendez brothers' house where they killed their parents. And now we're going to where Bugsy Siegel, one of the original gangsters and someone that has been accredited with, you know, the creation of the strip. Damn, these are so close together. So this is the house where Bugsy Siegel was killed and he was actually where the palm trees are. Chilling there, I believe, um, when someone shot him literally from across the street and they took out an eyeball and he died instantly. Um, this is it, this is a really nice house. They have redecorated it and everything. Um, but this is it. This was actually his ex-girlfriend's house or someone he was dating at the time. And I'll go into details once I talk about it, but damn. So the person that killed him had to have been standing across the street, like right here. That's so insane. And he went all the way to right there. So this one is confusing. There are so many names to remember. There are so many details. So please bear with me. And the murder I'm talking about is the murder of Benjamin Siegel, AKA Bugsy Siegel. And this was something that happened on June 20th, which is, isn't that weird? The last one was August 20th and this happened June 20th, but this happened in 1947. Bugsy Siegel was a hitman for the Italian mob and he grew up in New York um, and he was, Jewish American and he was working with the Italians in New York and he I'm not gonna go into detail about all of that because that's too much and this is a murder video but um Bugsy Siegel yes was involved with the mob and he is often credited with making Las Vegas what it was and it wasn't that he basically did this grand old thing, but during the time of his death, he had wanted to bring kind of glamor to Las Vegas. He believed that Las Vegas was just nothing special, just, you know, desert and a state where, well, Nevada, um, where gambling was legal. And so what he did and his role in creating the Las Vegas that we know now on the strip was he planned to build a hotel, a luxurious hotel. And that is now what was also then known as the Flamingo Hotel on the Las Vegas Strip. And so this hotel was actually created um, with the backing of mob money. So 
the reason that people say that he had a big footprint in that was one because he wanted to become a businessman and he focused on las vegas and he had this idea of backing the building of a hotel and it was after his death that the hotel got infamous and it just basically led to all eyes being on vegas and that was basically his contribution to the las vegas strip um but as you guys saw that beautiful house in Beverly Hills, eight minutes from the Menendez house, if I can add. Um, yeah, so someone was standing across the street and this murder has yet to be solved. This happened in the 40s and it's still unsolved. So what I had read was that, yeah, someone was standing across the street when they killed him with a 30 millimeter m1 carbon military m1 carbon and so he was actually with an associate at the time at his that was in his house that was his girlfriend's house um and there's like rumors theories about the fact that like this was a mob hit because he had angered a lot of people and he had killed a lot of people um and they told her to get out of town so she was out of town and he was staying there um, and yeah, shots rang in through the window and one shot him in the nose sort of and it came out of his right socket or it came, it hit it which the pressure led to his eye coming out and that's like crazy. Um, but basically I think there was nine bullets and four of them hit him and they killed him instantly. This is short, this one's short compared to the last one, right? Well. That's basically the story. We don't know much else. Um, I could probably spend, I would have to do super research to talk about him in detail, but if you guys are interested in hearing more about him or any of these cases, go ahead and just do a Google search. Um, and I'm pretty sure that you guys can spend days reading up on these cases. Um, I kind of just covered the gist of them and the murder itself, but yeah, the case is unsolved. It's a famous unsolved case in Los Angeles. And that's basically it. So with this one, I leave and I go to Sharon Tate's house. All right, so you guys know how the last episode I talked about the Manson murders and I talked about how Sharon Tate's house got demolished and it's replaced. Well, we're gonna go to that house. And the reason we're gonna go to that house, I don't even think you can really see anything, but I wanna go because apparently there is this light post, which is the only thing that still stands there, um, where I don't know exactly who of the Manson family did, but they climbed that tower to disconnect the telephone lines. And that is literally the only thing that still stands there. We're not going to be able to see anything, you can only be on the outside and we're going to go ahead and check that out. I didn't plan on going there, I thought it was a lot further because um, we're going to go up, we're also going to pass the Playboy Mansion, which I wish I could see that, um, but no one died there as far as I know. I should say I don't think anyone's gotten murdered there because I'm pretty sure Hugh Hefner died there. Okay, so <laughs> this place, we're going uphill because they lived overlooking a freaking hill. Oh my gosh, you can see it. That's the house, that's the house. Oh my god, can you guys see it? Oh my gosh, hold on. Do you guys see that house? That house up there? Oh my gosh, that's the house. That's the new one that they built. I'm like, almost 100% positive that that's the house. We're about to go up on Cielo Drive. And it says to drive carefully. I think this is... Oh my gosh. I think it's gated. I'm like 190% sure that it's gated. Okay. So the destination is on the left. I have to reverse. This thing is like hidden. I don't know if that's the pole, but this thing is hidden. I have no idea where it is. It's up there, 
I know that. But the house itself, how, I think it's that one on the bottom. And then it's like all this lake, like all these acres of land. Like that's the house. Like the only thing that I can think of is it's this house. Like, but this one says 1048, so I don't know where it is. I don't know where it is. I'll have to get back to you guys on this one. So leaving that part of Beverly Hills, we go to Sharon Tate and the Manson murders. And I talk about the Manson murders in detail um, in the first video because I covered the La Bianca murders. And okay, it was hard to do this because the house has been demolished the where Sharon Tate and her friends were murdered. And I will give the names of the friends because they're people too. But for the sake of just condensing, when I talk about this murder, it's known as the Tate La Bianca murders um, because these were the victims of the Manson family. So when I say Tate, I'm referring to all victims, but I will definitely give respect where respect is due by naming them all once I start talking about the case. But um, the Tate house was demolished. She was living in this house with her husband, Roman Polanski, famous director. Um, and she was eight months pregnant at the time. But before I go into that, yes, so the house was demolished and something new stands. And I think it's that huge thing that like I saw, I'm behind, like not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure that that's what it was. Okay, so I officially looked up the address and Google sent me to 1068 Cielo Drive, right? And I couldn't find it, as you guys can see in the video. So I was stuck on this address, 1048, and I'm like, oh, maybe if you go up, I don't know where I was, okay? The house that I showed you guys when I was going up Benedict Canyon, that was the new house. That's the new house where the property was. Once I got up there, yo, I don't know. I don't know where Google took me. Point is, we didn't end up at the house, but I'm still gonna talk about it because you can see the outside of it. And at the end of the day, we weren't gonna see the house anyway because it's gone, but you saw the outside of it. So I can talk about it, right? Um, like I said, go and check out the first video to get more background on the Manson family. I'm not gonna repeat that. Um, but the Tate murders were the murders that happened the day before um, the La Bianca murders that were mentioned in the first video in Los Feliz. And so this happened in August 8th, um, kind of in the night portion. So it was like August 8th, August 9th of 1969. And I am going to look down a lot because I can't pronounce all of the names, but essentially, yes, this is the murder of Sharon Tate. Stephen Parent, who was actually visiting, um, he was a caretaker for someone that was staying at the guest house um, in the Tate residence. Um, and Sharon Tate lived there with her husband, Roman Polanski, as I said. Um, they were actually just renting the place. And she had friends over that night. Uh, Jay Sebring was a famous hairdresser at the time. Um, Abigail Folger, um, which was one of the daughters of basically the heiress to Folger, the coffee brand. Um, so, and then I cannot pronounce this name, but um, Frykowski, I can pronounce the last name. I can't pronounce the first name. Um, but those were the victims. Okay, so in the past, uh, Charles Manson had been aware of the property because he was working there with the music producer who basically decided not to sign a deal with him or something like that. And so he knew the property and he sent Susan Atkins, uh, which you hadn't heard of her in the last one. She didn't participate in the La Bianca murders. Um, but Tex Watson, yes, we heard of him. Um, Linda Kasabian, I believe is her name. She was also um, 
sort of knew. Um, she was actually just a lookout in this one and she was a star witness, so she was actually granted immunity in the trials. And then Patricia Krenwinkel, she also participated in the LaBianca murders. So uh, you get the addition of Atkins, but you get the subtraction of Van Houten, who murdered um, Lino and Rosemary, um, LaBianca. And so what happens here is that pole that I was trying to find, apparently Tex is the one that climbed it and he basically cut the telephone lines. So that, you know, you can't call for help. And so they enter the home and they call, well, what first happens is, like I said, Stephen Parent is there visiting um, someone at the guest house and they shoot and kill him because um, they see his car. And then um, they gather Tate, Folger, Sebring, and Frykowski um, into the living room and they tie Tate and Sebring with ropes around their neck and Folger and Frykowski manage to escape and they run off, um, but they are, obviously they get them and they shoot and stab them. Um, Frykowski was said to have been stabbed more than 50 times, which is overkill, um, but these people were gruesome. Um, they end up shooting and stabbing um, Tate and Sebring as well, and Sharon Tate was eight months pregnant at the time, and so they basically, she pleaded for her baby's life, and they cut her stomach open, they cut the baby out of her. Um, the baby subcame to his injuries as well. Um, and Sharon Tate passed. They also wrote stuff on the walls um, with the victim's blood. They wrote the word pigs. And um, where in the other one, they put Helter Skelter, even though they misspelled it. Um, they put uh, death to pigs and stuff like that, alluding to police. Um, and I know I went in more detail for the La Bianca ones, but this is what I found um, when it comes to these murders. Um, it's, it's devastating because of all the lives that were lost and um, the two murders were actually not thought to be connected. They thought that the Tate uh, murders were a drug transaction gone wrong, um, but that wasn't the case. Um, the Manson family was staying at this ranch called Spawn Ranch. And if you guys are interested in the Manson murders, uh, Quentin Tarantino just dropped his ninth film, I believe. And it's called Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. He didn't just drop it, it came out in 2018. But um, it's based on the murders. Um, and so if you guys are interested, go ahead and watch it. Tarantino is a great filmmaker, director, writer. Um, but he is very violent and he likes to recreate history and so it's kind of like a it's a good watch if you're interested in the manson family but um so yeah they the manson family overtook this ranch called spawn ranch and um i believe something led police there i think they burned down or did something shady and so they arrested some of the manson family and one of them was atkins and they arrested her in connection to another murder and it was in prison that she was boasting about the fact that she killed Sharon Tate. And that's when they connected the murders and Linda Kasabian um, ended up taking a plea deal um, for immunity and she was the star witness against everyone. So um, that's basically what happened that night. Um, there are so many more details. There's actually photos out there um, once again. And if you're interested in that, go ahead and look them up. I'm not going to link them. Um, but those were the murders um, known as the Taint murders. And at this point, I've covered both of the Manson family killings. The most famous, as I mentioned in the last video, there was a third murder that I wasn't aware of. Um, and the person that committed that murder is the only Manson family member who actually was granted parole. And honestly, it's really interesting when you start getting into crime. Um, if you're not in it already, I don't know why you're watching this, maybe you're just supporting me, but um, this stuff is really interesting. Um, super interesting to me. And it's worth the read. 
um, just kind of thinking about the human psyche and how people can go so terribly wrong. Um, but yeah, this is the unofficial location of the Tate residence. I'm sorry I couldn't bring you guys to the exact gates and show you the actual pole that Tex climbed, but um, Google played me. So this is the house of Brandon Lee where he lived. Um, when he was killed, he didn't die here, but this was his house. Um, and if you guys don't know, Brandon Lee was the son of Bruce Lee. And yeah, this was his home. All right, so when it comes to talking about Brandon Lee, he wasn't murdered, but he was killed. So he was Bruce Lee's son, only son, and he was on the set filming a movie called The Crow. And some freak accident happened where one of the stunt guns was actually loaded with real ammunition and when it came to a scene where Brandon's character gets shot the gun goes off with live ammo and it pierces Brandon and he does not recover from this um, he was actually laying there, dying, bleeding out, while people thought that he was just acting. So it took a little bit of a while for people to recognize that he was actually hurt and dying. Um, and then obviously they got him help, but he didn't make it. And unfortunately, he passed away on the set. Um, they did end up completing the movie, so you guys can watch it. They did cut off, obviously, the scene that they had recorded where he's dying but you can actually hear the gunshot go off and apparently they left that in but um that is the death of brandon lee he was very young his father died young as well um but i was already really close to his house so i wanted to include him because he still died at the hands of someone else so that's going to be it for this episode of Murder Tour. This is going to be episode two. Episode three, I take you to the house where Marilyn Monroe committed suicide. And I know that's not a murder, but there are conspiracy theories about the fact that she was murdered. I have read that there's no substantial evidence to support that, um, but I was already in town. Um, I was in Brentwood, so I just figured let's go to where Marilyn Monroe lived. At the end of the day, she still passed. So um, then after that, I bring to you one of the most famous cases that you'll ever hear about in your lifetime, probably. And if you guys can guess what that is, also in Brentwood, then yay. <laughs> you don't want anything because I don't have anything to offer, but maybe in the future. Uh, but yeah, go ahead and leave a comment if you can guess what case I'm talking about. Um, and that's basically going to conclude my LA murder tour series. Um, I know it was short, only three episodes. Um, if I find other cases that are interesting, I'll go ahead and record that and talk about them. And, but this was episode two and I hope you enjoyed. I hope you were interested. Um, let me know what your favorite case this episode was um, or what was the most interesting fact or I don't know. Let me know anything. Let me know if you like these. Let me know if this one was better than episode one. Um, but I hope that you guys enjoy this and I'll catch you on the next one.